right, 8.01. Let's get going. Oh, nice, Will. You got rid of that thing at the top. We're still learning. Uh, okay, everyone, welcome to Grand Rounds. A little chilly out there today. That's why I put a white coat on as I walked over here. This is today's CME, which we'll put in the chat room in a second. Oh, nothing. There it is. For people with good eyesight, it's down here. A big thanks to Wayne Feng and everyone who did the uh, Triangle Heart Walk. They raised $8,500 for the uh, American Heart Association, American Stroke Association. So great work, everybody. And thanks to Wayne for organizing it. A look back at Duke history. Uh, this is a picture from February, 1964. These were the founding staff members, of the Duke Private Diagnostic Clinic on its 30th anniversary. And just for those who know, it's called Private Diagnostic Clinic for a reason. It was for people who had money, mostly white, almost all white, and um, maybe had insurance in those days. I didn't even know how many people had insurance, but it's a name I wish had gone away a long time ago, but for some reason it's persisted until alignment happens. But uh, there you go. Now, this was in the newspaper and it's an important issue. Uh, how to safely get rid of woodpeckers attacking your house. Apparently, if you've got a wooden roof or wooden siding, the woodpeckers come at them. And the question is why? Well, because there are bugs inside the wood that's breaking down. And even more importantly, they like the sound of the wood because it signals other woodpeckers not to enter. And here are what you do not do. You cannot hurt them because woodpeckers are federally protected. Who knew that? Do not shoot them. Do not throw hard objects at them. What should you do? Spray them with a water hose, use mylar tape, mylar balloons, or put an owl statue nearby to scare them off. But mostly you need to fix your siding or roof because it's breaking down and has bugs in it. Now, in our research roundup uh, this week, Brian McGrory and Dylan Ryan contributed to a new article looking at uh, risk factor for venous thromboembolisms in patients with CVT. I'm not sure, what's CVT? Venous cerebral venous thrombosis, there you go. I thought it was cerebrovascular thrombosis, but wrong. Carol Colton was part of a review article looking at infection and infl inflammation in Alzheimer's disease. And our own Atif Hussein, speaking of owls, was recently on CBS 17, discussed the impact of chronic late bedtimes on risk of health impacts. As most of you know, Adip does not sleep very much, but as healthy as can be. Now, this just happened yesterday, just so everyone knows. Here it comes again. The next anti-amyloid antibody showed almost the exact same results as aducanumab, the Biogen drug, which was uh, crushed by the market. But I'm sure this time they did not make the same mistake. So this one's likely to be approved and in use. And Will, as one of my caregivers said, you mean they have a drug that makes this last longer? So our all-stars, Wayne Feng nominated Andrea Scott, Dr. Hassan, and Sina. Uh, it's interesting that the neurosurgeon is doctor and our folks are first name only. Uh, provided incredible care, this is a true story, to a Duke employee who woke up with a major left MCA stroke. Because of their efforts, uh, the patient had a miraculous uh, outcome. And it's a true story and great work. Let me make this disappear again. I wonder why it came back down. Hide this one? Yes. Okay. And the next all star is put up by me. Uh, Will and Megan Phillips on the uh, recognition that JT is moving on to radiation oncology. JT's consistent dedication, integrity, ingenuity, and problem solving have been incredible to our department's growth and success for the past eight plus years. He will be deeply missed. Every single one of those words is right from our heart. Again, this is today's CME. And we're going to turn it over now to Joe Painter, who's going to do the case presentation.
Let me get mine down. Here we go. Alrighty, so today's case presentation is a pediatric case. Uh, so this is a 14, oh, thank you. Yeah. 14 year old female with uh, no significant past medical history who came into an outside hospital emergency department with two days of headache, emesis and vague balance issues. Uh, they found a purulent uh, TM on her exam and diagnosed her with acute otitis media, sent her on augmentin. However, the headache persisted. She started falling, came back two day, three days later. Uh, where she was presumed to be dehydrated, diagnosed with a UTI, and sent home on Keflex this time. Uh, but later that night, early next morning, uh, she had what sounds like a seizure with generalized tonic-clonic activity. EMS was called and she was transported back to the same outside hospital ED. So with infectious symptoms and a new seizure, uh, she obviously received an LP. The CSF was remarkable for no whites and a protein of 110. The outside hospital's uh, meningitis PCR was negative uh, for everything that they test for. Um, she was started on acyclovir, vein, conceptraxone prior to transferring here uh, due to concern for meningitis, obviously. And the only uh, imaging report was there was prominence in sulci and along the surface brainstem, which we took to mean just enhancement. Uh, so on further history, once she got here, uh, talking to her a little bit more, she endorsed some hallucinations that had been going on uh, for the previous months. Also a disrupted sleep pattern um, for the same amount of time, roughly. And then her mom commented that she is just been increasingly irritable and rude, even for her teenage self. So vital is just remarkable for a fever to 103, and then exam just remarkable for dysmetria, dysmetria and bilateral finger to nose. Uh, so her hospital course, she continued to have a uh, pretty bad headache, neck pain, nausea. Uh, so we continued her workup, repeated MRI and LP, opening pressure of 45, and then this time had some pleocytosis in addition to the elevated protein. We continued her on uh, the same antimicrobials, added doxy uh, just for tick-borne coverage uh, until her PCR came back negative. And then ultimately she was started on autoimmune encephalitis treat treatment with methyl pred um, with a multi multidisciplinary discussion with ID, uh, neuro and rheumatology for presumed autoimmune encephalitis. On the 20th, uh, she was RT to the PICU uh, for another seizure and ultimately was intubated and got a stat CT head because of some severe hemodynamic instability. So to look at her imaging, uh, this was her MRI T1 with contrast on arrival here, um, just commented on diffuse leptomeningeal enhancement and venous engorgement or vascular engorgement. And then unfortunately this was her CT. Uh, so this was after her significant event leading to uh, intubation. So diffuse edema, loss of gray white differentiation, sulcal effacement. Um, so she was started on mannitol hypertonic, neurosurgery consulted, and unfortunately she ended up passing um, a few days later, just about less than a week before um, presentation, or sorry, less than a week since presentation. So her labs, uh, she got the full gamut of fancy send out labs and everything pretty much up here was still pending at the time of her death. Um, the only thing that came back positive ultimately was this Mayo send out autoimmune encephalitis panel. Uh, and it was just remarkable for a elevated N-type calcium channel antibody. Everything else was negative. Uh, so the N-type calcium channel, voltage-gated calcium channel, uh, likely plays a role in neuronal migration during early brain development. It is indicated in autoimmune encephalitis, um, most, mostly described in adult cases, um, but there have been some pediatric cases. It's um, a very vague presentation, so wide range of CSF findings. Often there's no EG or MRI findings, nothing specific that would indicate uh, this as the etiology of autoimmune encephalitis. In adults, they're often as associated with malignancies, but due to just the uh, low number of cases in pediatrics, there hasn't really been any correlation. Um, because this patient was a pediatric patient, they were referred to the medical examiner, uh, so don't have final results on an autopsy at this time. Um, and she never received any imaging below the neck to know if she had any additional uh, malignancies. Um, but in looking at this topic, there were uh, there is a lot of study ongoing with uh, targeted therapies, so cannabinoids, Keppra, et cetera. Um, in the future, if hopefully we can identify this as the etiology early on and autoimmune encephalitis course could um, have a little more intentional treatment. That's all I got. Thank you. So, I mean, 
that's clearly a tragic, devastating case. Uh, and not quite finished yet. I, I, what I would say is anyone has some thoughts on that case, please send an email to Joe and CC me on it. Uh, I don't think of autoimmune encephalitis as being febrile persistently like that or having what looks like just an incredible inflammation, almost like an infectious disease, but uh, uh, any other thoughts would be greatly appreciated. Now, uh, and we'll give you a follow-up. Uh, to introduce our grand round speaker, Noreen. Morning, everyone. It's actually really nice to be back in person. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce our grand round speaker today, Federico. He actually comes to us from Medical University of South Carolina, where he's currently an assistant professor. I think we started about maybe a year apart or so. <laughs> but his original training began at Universidad del Salvador in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And he actually did his neurology residency at Loyola University, after which he actually went on to do two fellowships, <laughs> one in cognitive neurology and the second in movement disorders. Um, I think he was already planning to start the bridging at University of Cincinnati. He actually uh, then was recruited to MUSC in 2017, where he juggled doing a master's in clinical research, as well as dividing his research niche. And um, specifically, he received a pilot grant to study septalamic nucleus in language impairment in Parkinson's disease. He was quite successful because this year he actually received an R21 to define the role of the septalamic nucleus in language production through DBS. And I think this is part of a broader field direction and interest in movement disorders to understand cognition in movement disorders. So I'm very much looking forward to his talk. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Noreen. Thank you for thank you for the invitation. It's uh, an honor to be here. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my research. Is there a feedback? Uh, okay. Let's see. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my interest, my research, and um, hopefully try to uh, rope other people into this field because we need more people. <laughs> so I have no no disclosures. Um, so. One of the things that uh, that drove me to this to this field was well, obviously seeing patients, right? And and sometimes you see patients, and uh, we and movement disorders were very good at describing our bradykinesia because we know how to evaluate it, we know what what the mechanisms may, may be behind it, and how to treat it. Um, but there are other things that happen when we see patients that we just don't know how to describe. We can say, oh, you know, there's something off about this patient, or there's something that's changed, but I I don't have the right word, or I don't know how to evaluate it. Um, and we are supposed, all of us are supposed to talk to patients, right? We're supposed to communicate with them. And sometimes during those dialogues is when we sense there might be something off. Um, but may, sometimes we don't, we examine and, and the, with our, the tools that we have and things may not be very different, but I, so that's where I think that communication changes um, are important and important to detect and important to, to, be, to evaluate. Uh, and it's something that, if you ask people with, with Parkinson's disease and, and their caregivers, it's something that affects them uh, throughout the course of the disease. And we'll talk that there are different mechanisms behind it, um, but it affects the caregivers and also quality of life of, uh, of, and, the, and the caregiver burden. And here is um, some like unpublished data that, that we have on, uh, there's a scale called the CPIB, that's the Commun Communication Participation Inventory Battery, uh, where we compared pre-DBS patients uh, that were going through, uh, Evaluated for essential tremor versus those with Parkinson's disease. And when you get 30, that means that you have no problems and you get a lower score, it means that you have more problems communicating. And we can see that there's a, a lot of variability in Parkinson's disease and not, and there's a, uh, also a significant difference between the two populations. So again, I was talking with Andy Lou about maybe that a good idea in the future may be to recruit at least a cohort of um, controls, um, uh, but th this is some preliminary data that we're, that we're working on. Um, and again, I, this are, there are different mechanisms um, when we talk about um, communication deficits in Parkinson's disease. Some of them have to do more, more with a motor aspect. Uh, we know about changes in voice with hypophonia. There are also uh, changes in uh, motor control so, and that it can lead to dysarthria and the typical pheno phenotype is hypophonic dysarthria. Um, but there's also changes in language and that's one. Just gonna yeah. change your life here. There you go. Yes, thank you. 
Um, but there's also changes in languages. That's what I'm going to be focusing a little bit on. Okay. Uh, let's see. So the outline today is uh, to talk a little bit about the language model that we use in clinic and uh, that has driven a lot of our research. And as a movement disorders uh, person, I care a lot about the basal ganglia and I wanna know what the basal ganglia do. And when people ask me how do I get involved in this, I think that uh, in neurology, we were taught to localize. And uh, I always have a hard, very hard time when people ask me, okay, you do movement disorders and you do cognition, what do the basal ganglia do for cognition? And it's always a tricky <laughs> question to answer. So that's what I'm trying to figure out. And in order to, at some point in my life, give us uh, an intelligent answer that is also true. Uh, um, so we're gonna talk about that. So when, when we think about communication and language, uh, we use a model that uh, we were taught in medical school and has not changed in many decades that uh, comes from, from, uh, from um, case reports uh, and then further research that happened from about two centuries ago. So the first was the Lichtheim model where that's based on finds by Broca and Wernicke's and also the uh, And then Norman Geschwin um, polished in, uh, the, that, um, that model and, and including the arcuate fasciculus and, and thinking about the, connect, the connection between those, those two regions. And, Again, models are a great place to start learning things, but it's important to know that there are limitations and understand. And I think anyone here that has seen a patient uh, that they suspect an aphasia and they look at the MRI, they think they're gonna find Broca's aphasia and the, the stroke may be somewhere else or someone has a lesion in what's supposed to be Broca's area and the picture is totally different. So there's a lot of inconsistencies. Um, I always say that patients don't read the books, right? We read the books and we think have an idea and then patients do whatever they want. Um, so there are limitations to this, to this model. First is uh, the lack of spatial precision, right? So that these areas, we, it's, uh, we may think we know exactly where they are, but, but there's variability on what people consider these areas. This is a, a, a paper that where they polled uh, language specialists. So it was not like uh, random people uh, to define where uh, they, they, they consider what they consider to be uh, Wernicke's area. And you can see it's a big variability, right? And that's important because if we're talking about a study that showed uh, hypoactivation or activation of what we consider um, Wernicke's area, if, if, there's, if there's variability on what we, what we call that area, then uh, our results will be skewed, right? And also it goes without saying that it's focused on cortical structure. Um, uh, we think that the cortex is the only, the only part of the, of the nervous system <laughs> that has, that's, has something to do with, with cognition. And um, I'm here to try to make you reconsider that, that position. And that's also lesion-based, right? Uh, it comes out with stroke. Obviously stroke can give us um, a good model uh, to some extent to see differences, right? If someone who's able to talk and all of a sudden they can, um, but there are other there are other things that we have, need to consider, and I think that I don't know, primary aphasia have given us a good model to look at other areas of the brain, and also it's focused on single word processing. Um, when we evaluate someone for aphasia, we ask them to repeat a string of words and name, but la language and communication is way more than that. So those are things that are li limitations of of this model, uh, and then there are multiple models that have um, come up, and also models that uh, imply for different aspects of communication, some more for comprehension, others for production, uh, for grammar. So there's a lot of things, but this still, you can see all these models that I'm showing you. And uh, I, I, this was an unbiased um, selection, all in focus on, on, the, on the cortex. Um, so I think that just for, for the trainees, it's to, a good idea to think about how we characterize the function of a brain region. And there are different methods we can look at this and all, and some of them have, and all of them have the limitations and, their, their uh, advantages. So, but it's important to understand when we're looking at a, at a paper and we're looking at evidence behind um, uh, uh, calling that a, the saying that a certain region plays a role in a certain uh, uh, process, where does that evidence come from? If it does it come from a, like a lesion um, based model like stroke, uh, which has become is, po is popular now with also with all the connectomics uh, approach. Is it, is it, is it uh, more activation using things like, like PET, fMRI, EEG, or know, MEG as well, or other uh, interventions like simulation or inhibition like TMS or TDCS or even DBS. Um, and also I think that it, I'm pitching to the choir here, but we know that we don't, we don't think about like the brain working in distinct regions 
um, that perform a single uh, a single uh, function. But we think of the brain as a network. I think the more um, we think about it, it, it's it's clear that that that's the way that the the brain works, and that's the approach that makes more sense and explains uh, findings better. And that's important not only from um, to understand normal function, but also to under, understand why we see variability. Um, it's easy to to say, well, you know, this person has a part has on the has a stroke in in the inferior frontal gyrus, and uh, they don't have problems like. What what mechanism the, the, maybe then we can, understanding uh, cognitive resilience and um, and an adaptation a net, network adaptation um, may help us understand that and and what I'm showing there is how there are certain uh, mechanisms that are of uh, of network maladaptation that can lead to problems. A, a good example of that would be spasticity after a stroke, and others where there's a compensatory mechanism like what we see maybe in in Child, child that have children that have um, an early stroke in what's uh, maybe an, a language eloquent area, and then they're able to form their uh, language normally. Okay, and also the, the finding uh, what what is a cognitive process, and I think that uh, going back to this idea that there's not a single region that performs a single task, I think the same thing applies when we think about cognitive processes. Um, the brain, and I think that thinking of a brain as a computer is a, can be a useful uh, metaphor, and uh, or maybe we think of it as a factory, right? Where depending on what you put in, is what you're gonna get out. So uh, there's certain regions that perform a certain task, and depending where they get their input, that's the result you're gonna get when it's affected. So there, there are regions that that are involved in multiple and multiple kind of processing, depending on what you what you're evaluating. Um, that's what you're going to find. And I think a good example, and, and also thinking that when we'll, the way we evaluate cognition and cognitive processes, uh, there's never one test that looks at one cognitive process. And that's important to, to consider because we, each task, particularly the ones that we do like in our psychological evaluations, tap into multiple um, cognitive processes and uh, thinking that, uh, and so it's important to consider. So for example, a verbal fluency, which is something that I always have a hard time explaining what, if someone has decreased verbal fluency, what does it mean? How does it affect people? Um, it, it implies multiple processes, right? So you have to think about storage, lexical research, retrieval, selection, also suppression of alternatives. And actually we, I, I, have, I don't have a slide here today, but we looked at uh, also preliminary data with discourse measures and verbal fluency is not, does not correlate with the amount of words you, you produce. Uh, people that have reduced uh, amount of fluency may not necessarily produce less words during uh, a discourse task. And I think, well, that's, I don't think I'm gonna talk a lot about that today, but thinking about discourse as a different way of assessing language rather than focusing on naming and repetition. Um, so, uh, the, the, so the question here is, are the base of the ganglion ball in language? That's the question that, that uh, probably I'm trying to hear to answer. And language is the same as cognition is a big thing, right? There's a lot of things that are involved and a lot of processes that are involved. And uh, it, it can go from simple things that is from, from mechanistic uh, processes like phonology, where it's just emitting the sounds to finding words, putting the words uh, with the correct Grammar and and um, which is would be more than morphology and then arranging the words in a in a way that makes sense with, with proper syntax and thinking about also the semantics and and also the pragmatics of the of language. So there's a lot of it's when you, someone says you study cognition or study language, it may sound simple, but there's a lot of processes that are entailed and that's trying to dissect that uh, going from the more general aspect to the specific process it can be quite, quite a journey. Um, so there's, and here I'm going to run, uh, tell you a little bit about some of some research that has shown some evidence on the on the war, on the role of the basal ganglia, particularly the the striatum on um, on in in, uh, in language. So there are different um, lines uh, of evidence, mainly uh, with learning. Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, th there's this idea that the there's this, I mean, hypothesis that the that the striatum is involved in learning, and particularly the more frontal the air, the more complex the process, or the more advanced the learning, um, the more frontal the 
the, the more frontal, the, the area, the region of the, of the trident that's activated. Also with sequencing, um, I don't know if you've heard, uh, probably heard of the procedural declarative model by Ullman where the basal ganglia play a, play a role in what's more um, rule-based language. So, and it's, we have evidence of this in Parkinson's disease. I don't know if I, have, if I put this on the slide, but that Parkinson's disease people have difficulty um, to have difficulty coming up with uh, working with regular verbs while irregular verbs they don't have any problems because irregular verbs as you have to remember them it's not that they're not rule based they're more um, temporal based, based on temporal function more than um, frontostriatal function uh, also there's the, uh, the basic they play a role in um, in selection so particularly processing ambiguous words and sentences so if you if uh, there's a complex sentence that that um, that you need to probably hold the information for a little bit longer uh, in order to understand the sentence that uh, the, there's activation. And uh, most of the studies are fMRI based uh, uh, activation of the frontal striatum and also response suppression. There's a task that we use clinically that's called the hailing, uh, uh, the hailing uh, sentence task where they, they have to yeah, you give them a, a sentence uh, and they have to finish the complete the sentence with a word that has, has nothing to do with what the sentence would be. So instead of saying like, uh, the mailman delivered the, and the, and you, the proponent response will be to say letter, but you had to say something completely different, something that they delivered the, 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 the winter, something that has nothing to do. And also retrieval um, with fluency. We know that, um, and there's some debate here uh, with with stroke that uh, strokes in the stream can affect uh, um, language features such as fluency, uh, grammar, and also can lead to paraphrases and prosody. However, um, this study that I think, think was very uh, helpful in 2002 by R.G. Hillis showed that that um, that subject that had a basal ganglia stroke and had aphasia usually had hyperperfusion to the cortex, thinking that it's not so much the basal ganglia cells that cause the aphasia, but there's an associated hyperperfusion. Again, there's, um, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and I, even though it's not technically basal ganglia, but it's part of the circuit. So I think it's important to include it. Uh, the thalamus um, has been proposed to play a, a role in, in language as well, and multiple roles, particularly when it has to do more with attention and, uh, sem and, se and uh, semantic and lexical selection. So I well, heard of the th of thalamic aphasia, which you think about it, it's fluctuating. They have may have difficulty with with naming and semantic paraphasias. Um, so it might be that I think that the thought here is not so much that the, that the thalamus is involved uh, in language per se, but it's involved in some process that have to do with communication. Um, and in, in uh, you know the generative disorders with Parkinson's disease, there's obviously impaired verbal fluency. We think about uh, verbal fluency as a marker of early cognitive decline, and we use it in it drives a lot of the DBS research when people freak out about cognitive changes after STN DBS. And uh, there's more problems with verbs more than nouns um, and uh, with, with also with switching, which we see in Parkinson's disease. And also with syntax, they have uh, people with Parkinson's may have diff difficulty with comprehension more, more than production. And this is one of the studies that we published looking at the dorsal stream, one of the models that we use for, for language production, which is looking at the connectivity between the caudate and the dorsal stream. And that uh, had a, let's say a so-so correlation with, with letter fluency performance. Um, and also uh, with and other uh, degenerative diseases that affect the, um, that affect the basal ganglia, such as Huntington's disease and tauopathy, such as PSP, where we see more of a, what we call a dynamic aphasia, where they have difficulty with initiation uh, of, of, of speaking. And then um, thinking about other ways of understanding the basal ganglia is obviously with deep, deep brain stimulation. And uh, I think that all of us that work with DBS from a clinical perspective, we one of the things that we have to consider before for target selection or even for eligibility is cognition. And there are certain measures, particularly verbal fluency, which are very relevant. And you look at what has driven a lot of the research in uh, with the regarding the concerns of cognitive impairment in after STN DBS, and that has has been driven by findings in verbal fluency. Um, but there's it's it's variable, and 
most of the studies done in DBS look at bilateral DBS. And uh, when they look at, not a lot of look at laterality and the, the ones that do, usually they, what they do is they activate one side, do a, a verbal task, and then they activate the other side. But there's already implantation. So someone may argue that there's the micro lesional effect is, has already happened. So that's where, why, uh, where R21 comes, comes in. I think that the, 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 the summary, because I, I said all, all things is, is it a, so the answer was, well, is it really involved in language? Is it language specific or is it something where the, it plays a role in a process that has to do with language? And I think it's more domain general, right? I think that that's the way we have, I think about cognition in general now. Uh, even, even when we think about primary progressive aphasias, uh, this applies, right? You think about semantic variant of PPA, and yes, it, there's difficulty in knowing what the word means, but there's a, 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 agnosia, a, a general agnosia. So that obviously a, a language is the most prominent finding, or the, even the logopenic variant of PPA, where there's a difficulty with retaining information or with working memory. So the same thing applies to the basal ganglia, where it, 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 it uh, plays a role in cognition. It works a process, and depending where the input and the input comes and the output goes, that's what you're going to find. And that's what the result you're going to get. And, but those, those roles are important in learning and multilingualism. We, there's a lot of evidence with uh, uh, bilinguals the, uh, and their activation of basal ganglia when they're switching from one, uh, one, from one language to another, and also with syntactic processing. So all things that require um, high demand or even sometimes competition, right? So uh, thinking about an ambiguous word, I don't know, the meaning for the word uh, bank, right? Or uh, more complex sentences. It depends on what you have to think about the context and, and what which the word is being is being said. So yeah, this is a basic summary. Uh, so they have a domain general uh, role in cognition, that, which, which also applies to communication. And uh, it doesn't necessarily cause aphasia, uh, but we need to know, uh, I think that we need a little more refined and sophisticated um, evaluations. Uh, yesterday, we were talking about how what we use in clinic to evaluate um, well, to evaluate language is like cave painting, even though I was misunderstood and I said I thought I was saying cake painting, it was cave painting. So there's a lot of things that we can do more sophisticated to understand uh, what, what the, 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 the role of, of uh, the basal ganglia in language. And I think a good way of understanding is what do the basal ganglia do and how do what, what would be the mechanism behind it, behind this? Because all of this that I mentioned is like, okay, there's a lesion, something happens, so, and we see this. So what do you, pro, what do you propose may be happening? What do the basic guy normally do that is now missing um, that, could expl that, that it could explain why uh, we see this, these deficits? And again, there's a very vast uh, number of operations that the basic ganglia may play. Thing one is with more with working memory, not working memory in the sense of retaining information active or available while you're processing it. Um, operational learning, we know that the, the basic ganglia play a big role in, in, in learning and also at uh, action selection. Uh, not only maintaining attention, uh, also setting the threshold for to determine an action, but also set shifting and inhibition, and also with, with sequencing. So those are some of the basic operations. Um, and I'm some, some of you are very familiar with, with this. We think about the organization of the basal ganglia with parallel circuits, uh, even though uh, it was initially proposed, the proposal was proposed to be um, separate. We know that there's some degree of integration. So basically, the basal ganglia are nuclei where we have afferents and efferents, and they, they work and uh, they are arranged in closed circuits that rely on the cortex. And the important thing here is that the function of the basal ganglia will depend on what. Part of the cortex are connecting to. So I think that that's, that's, that's important to think that the, the striatum will not, it doesn't do something specific. It depends on what part of the striatum you're, it's affected or you're stimulating and, and what network you're affecting. And I think that's part that can be challenging uh, to measure. And that's why sometimes we have some conflicting information. Okay. Um, and there are three pathways. Um, something uh, that we, uh, I think now I, 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 I know them, but it took a lot of learning, a lot of probably basal ganglia activity to learn the, the, the circuitry. There are three pathways, right? So the direct path with, and the direct pathway um, that goes from the, the striatum, um, uh, the striatum to the frontal cortex that usually is supposed to facilitate, in this case, movement, which is what we know a little more about. Then the indirect pathway, which is supposed to suppress um, to suppress movement and um, 
to suppress movement. And then there's a hyper direct pathway that was described a couple of decades ago that, were, that is uh, an inhibitory pathway from the frontal cortex directly to the to the to the SDN, and that's supposed to be, uh, I mean, it stimulates the SDN, which in, in, inhibits movement uh, in, in general. So, so those are the three three pathways. And what different these three pathways? You may think, well, do they work the same way, or uh, what is the outcome in general? And the and this these three pathways play different roles and they work in different ways. So the hyperdrive pathway is usually uh, the important thing to know is that. The hyperdirect pathway is myelinated, and so it's a faster pathway. So that's why it's also called hyperdirect. Where where the direct and indirect pathway are not myelinated, so they take a little bit longer to react. As the direct pathway is direct, it has less steps. It's usually the outcome is usually going to be a little bit faster, and um, the indirect pathway is going to take a little bit uh, take a little bit longer. So in the sequence of how these pathways are activated, the hyperdirect will be the fastest one, then the direct pathway, and then direct pathway, and the the hypothesis is that the hyperdirect pathway will suppress a movement, will stop a movement completely. The direct pathway will promote a movement. Will say, okay, well, we should do this type of movement, we, movements around this, I don't know, this neighborhood or area. And then direct pathway helps with with the selection of the of the competing movement. So you because you can only do one movement at a time, and um, so that that's where the, that that inhibition is uh, is important. And, we'll, and this is another slide just to explain this a little bit more. Um, thinking about center surround model where you have when you want to move you have multiple options of what, what you can do there's a lot of things that if you want to i don't know if i want to walk that way we could start i could start with the right foot the left foot uh, i don't know i could jump but um but yeah there has to be like okay there's a there's all you have all these different options um we need to narrow it down and and know uh, which one we can do so we can do one thing at a time um, and we see this with, with DBS, with different effects with DBS. Um, this study by a group in Germany uh, looked at uh, STN DBS and looking at uh, automatic and control saccade uh, and, and uh, looking uh, using uh, field, field potentials. They um, suggested that inhibition of the hyperdirect pathway correlated with the, with the reaction time. So thinking that that plays a role um, with suppression and initiation of the movement, but inhibition of the indirect pathway correlated with, with the speed. So the, the speed of, of the saccade, thinking that there might be, even within movement, those pathways play a different, a different role. Um, inhibition is a, we know that particularly for the STN and the basal ganglia, inhibition uh, plays a big role. And we may think, well, it's inhibition as a whole, but there are different taxonomies, different ways of understanding uh, inhibition. It can be depending on the goal. It can be like something proactive where we already know we have to suppress this impulse or reactive where some, something is thrown at us and we have to inhibit it. Um, or, and even the mechanism it has to be with, to do with stopping the, the, the response or delaying the response until we get more information. And also depends on what outcome was being uh, inhibited. Uh, is it like a, a response that we just want to put out when, I don't know, someone says something that we don't like, and then we remember that that person is, we, we should not mess with that person for X or Y, X, y or Z, or we have to interfere, we have to um, select and uh, not pay attention to uh, distracting stimuli, uh, or an interference of previously information that was previously relevant and competing responses or wanted responses. So the different ways of looking at, at inhibition. Um, and I think a good model that has been proposed by Jahan Shani um, is that there's there are two types of, of behavioral inhibition. One is more proactive, so thinking that well, I want I want to do something, and therefore I have to inhibit all uh, the separate goals, and uh, that that has to do more with the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex uh, and through the caudate. And we think about the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex as uh, being a big role in in uh, goal direction and planning and uh, getting things done. And then a second one, which is more reactive, which is more habit driven, that uh, it doesn't have to do too much. It's not, that does not involve the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, but more the inferior frontal cortex, which uh, also is uh, the region where we, we consider broker areas to be part of. And um, these two, these two um, types of, uh, of behavioral inhibition are, um, I mean, are, done or through different mechanisms. So the the one that I talked that, that I mentioned previously with the reactive one with it, that plays a role with, with the uh, right and field frontal 
inferior gyrus, um, particularly this is supposed to be more lateralized to the right through um, beta stimulation, plays a role with stopping the stimulus, stopping the action. So it just even before the selection process is going on, it stops the um, supposed to stop that uh, that pattern in, in this case of motor pattern, right? And uh, however, the the pre SMA when you activate the pre SMA and, and the, the hyperbaric pathway through the PSMA, what it does, it elevates the threshold, uh, the decision threshold. So it's like, okay, we have to get more information before we, we make this movement. And that, this is why this um, pathway has also been proposed to play a role in things like freezing of gait, uh, where, you have, where you're walking and, uh, and you kind of, you're doing something, have a normal flow of, of gait and all of a sudden gets uh, people freeze. And I, as I said before, there are different uh, inhibition taxonomies. So there are different ways that we can evaluate uh, inhibition. So, and this plays a role of what type of inhibition we're looking at. So there are go, no go tasks where you ask them, where you ask subjects to do something and if they get a signal, they, they have to do it. So there, there will be more uh, reactive inhibition. Uh, where if you use uh, the flanker task, which is what I show there with, with, um, with the arrows, uh, they have to, you show them a, a set of five hours, a line of arrows, and they have to, uh, the answer has to be what, where, where, what direction is the middle arrow pointing towards and which, so you have to suppress the, the other alternatives. And then we've all heard about the, uh, the Stroop task, which again, you have to suppress proponent responses. We will, we will tend more to, to read um, the word rather than thinking about, about the color. And then as like hailing a sentence completion task, I mentioned that before, and semantic interference tasks where you have, um, they show a picture and there might be a word that, that doesn't describe the picture that you're saying and you have to say what the picture is. Sometimes it's even a sound. This deficit in inhibition has consequences, right? Uh, we, I think a lot of people know how we have about the difficulties with impulse control disorders, but also punding and also the, the basal ganglia have been um, thought to play a role in Tourette's syndrome and obsessive compulsive disorder. So this deficit in inhibition uh, not only play a, a role from a motor perspective, but also a behavioral and, and as I'm talking about our language, I'm gonna argue that it's the, the their own in language as well, okay? Uh, so this is, all of this was to tell you my, about my hypothesis and uh, what we're trying to evaluate with this new uh, grant that, that's, uh, that we started working on. Um, and basically the first thing is um, when you think about coming up with a word, it's very similar to when you want to uh, come up with a motor program, right? You wanna do something, you kind of have a goal, but there are different ways that you can say it and you can, or even you see some, you see an image and it can, it can bring up different um, concepts or words that, that are good alternatives. I don't know, I may see uh, that things on, on, on the desk there and I may say, well, there's coffee uh, or there's a donut, there's a bakery, so there are the croissants. There, there are different words that can become activated and because of we're only one person, we can only see one thing at a time. So in our, that activation, uh, that widespread activation needs to be um, inhibited. So that way you can say one thing at a time. And that's where I argue that, that, um, that basic ganglia play a role here. And there's some evidence when it comes with lexical retrieval, um, particularly this work from Croissant where um, they ask uh, the, the subjects, this was done with, um, with uh, PET scans, um, where they ask subjects to say words under separate conditions. So ca categories of saying, I know bird, all the birds you can mention. Uh, you can say or rhyming uh, things that rhyme that have nothing that where there's not a category but more of a uh, phonemic um, similarity and then non words and uh, this the pre SMA basic ganglia was activated during the category and rhyme task where, where they were saying actual words um, but not during the non word task so it tells you that there's something specific to uh, in terms of, of language um, so th they suggest that it might be like a pre SMA basic ganglia loop uh, when it comes to retrieving uh, retrieval of, of words. Um, and then there's some evidence from a group in Australia where they uh, looked at resolving interference, looking at this picture, uh, picture interference where the, the subject had to mention, have to uh, name the, uh, the image uh, that's green. And so there's, you can get, you can see you have mentioned bear, bed, or um, even uh, glass. 
and th there the left coded activity was enhanced in word production that it, that involved uh, suppressing irrelevant words and also uh, resolving semantic inter interference. Um, so there's some evidence there, and evidence in Parkinson's disease uh, that we have evidence that two studies done in Parkinson's disease were with subject with normal cognition, and there's no there was no difference in the pattern of activation of basal ganglia when they were when they were trying to come up with words uh, that with semantic inter interference, but no studies um, were, were done with patients with cognitive impairments or complaints of were finding difficulty. So if you have if you evaluate only patients that that have normal cognition, you're uh, it's it, it, I, I don't think it's surprising to find that there's might not be so much difference with with uh, PD controls. The only thing that they found in this study by Isaacs is that the that even though the performance was uh, was similar, uh, the the level of activation, uh, particularly at, at the level of the, of the of the striatum, was higher in controls compared to um, to Parkinson's disease, suggesting that there might be other compensatory mechanisms to explain that. Um, so, in summary, the basic ganglia are relevant uh, uh, for word and phonemic retrieval, and particularly when multiple competing alternatives exists, and uh, they might be supported by different loops and depending on the task that you that that you want to evaluate. But we need more studies focused on, on the striatum and the basal ganglia loop. Uh, and I think one of the things that uh, is important is that the role of laterality uh, remains poorly defined. And so we think about we we think about language as lateralized to the not to, to usually the left hemisphere, um, but we don't think about that way from um, uh, with, when it comes to the to the basal ganglia. So I think I so uh, basically the and I don't have a slide for this, but the our study is going to be looking at uh, the effect of. Uh, unilateral DBS on language. So we're going to evaluate patients before they go through STN, uh, sothalamic nucleus uh, DBS, uh, and they have the set of tasks that have more like a comprehensive language evaluation with naming, discourse measures, gram, uh, like uh, grammar and syntax, um, and also some inhibition tasks, uh, four sets of like four uh, inhibition tasks, two that, inhib two that are language based and two that are non-language based. And, um, one, and one is two that are looking at proponent responses. The other one is suppressing uh, irrelevant, um, yeah, so irrelevant, irrelevant stimuli. Um, and we're gonna look at right, but also compare uh, pre and post and also right versus left. So I hope that um, in maybe a couple, in two years, we'll have something interesting because this, uh, and, and the idea of this uh, study is to even though it's focused on languages to expand it to, to cognition in general, looking at the role of laterality, because when it comes to DBS, particularly even if we're continue doing bilateral DBS, knowing uh, the role of cognition on, on one side versus the other can, can have uh, clinical implications. So that, that's basically what, and in this case, we're also looking at the, the role of the hyperdirect pathway, uh, thinking that the hyperdirect pathway plays a role in, in inhibition of, of words. So I think that's, all I have to say, these are like in future steps. And thank you. Any questions? Thank you. So, no. uh, so yes, we take over. Again, anyone uh, on the, uh, you know, the great internet who has questions, just put your name or your question in the uh, chat box and we'll get to you. And anyone here, Nicole. The striking disconnect of, of someone with dyscrasia kinesia and a threat and a ball is thrown at them and they move quickly to catch it so that you're gauging different subjects. The language parallel is sort of when you, you know, it's the first time when you presented it that way, the light bulb went off of how we're testing language in a very discreet domain that may not be the example of when we're using our basal ganglia for language, which could be quite often and, and more possible in the more naturalistic discourse settings like you're yeah. Uh, that, that, and could you repeat the question? Yes, it's yeah, on yeah, the uh, internet. Yeah, so so that the the comment was um that the way this this paradigm of thinking about basal ganglia and um 
basic ganglia in a, in a, in a similar way uh, for movement and, and cognition where you have, it depends on the context the, that the, uh, the response is measured. Um, and I think the parallel what we, we, we see in, in movement disorders where we sometimes see people that are very slow, but you give them, I don't know, a soccer ball or a basketball and they can, they can move quickly and they can move normally when, again, what happens there is that they have the options of what they can do are probably reduced and they, they already have some train, like training and specific skills. And um, so it's a similar parallel of what happens in, in, uh, with language. And I think, uh, and, to, and Dr. Kalko was also commenting on uh, the approach of looking at more a naturalistic approach to language um, where sometimes we, we evaluate it in a very um, primitive way, looking at only naming and, uh, and repetition where I think in the end, we know that language is way more than that and looking at discourse and just to, I, I think I, I, I summarized what you said. <laughs> um, so, and, and my, my response to that is yes, I think that uh, when I started uh, this process, I was I was um, heavily influenced by the uh, by my clinical uh, practice of aphasia and uh, and I, I initially I can tell I was kind of like well should I do this there's not no good evidence that we people have done looked at this in this way and and there's not a lot of good evidence but I, the more I thought about it looking at more studies that have that um, are not clinically based but uh, look at more from a linguistic perspective there's a lot of things that we have not done and they, that I think can be useful. And, I, and interestingly enough, the role of discourse and connected speech has not been evaluated a lot. And, uh, and I think that it, it's something that could be, could be an interesting avenue. Maybe not so much to, um, to look at, 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 at from a diagnostic perspective, but definitely from a progression perspective. And I think that uh, probably when in, in Parkinson's disease, we're, we're always very concerned, like, oh, when, when does chronic impairment start? I think that that might be, and that's something that I'm, I'm kind of trying to develop. It was not right to present today. But. So uh, next question is the internet. We alternate internet and then Noreen's next after this. Uh, Greg Kogan, you had a question or a comment? You want me to read it, Rich? Is that the way we're doing this? You don't have to read it, just ask it. All right, well, I'm gonna do both. Uh, thanks. That was a great talk. Um, I work more recent work by um, F. Fedorenko, who's at MIT, has really emphasized this sort of dedicated, encapsulated language system as opposed to other domain general, you know, things like you know attention and execution or executive function and whatnot. So, with sort of that in mind, do you see the things that you're discussing with uh, fluency and word finding? as part of a dedicated language circuit that goes through the basal ganglia? Or do you think of this more as the execution of a language process that's previously occurred? I mean, how do you sort of intertwine no. those views? And, and I think that actually the work from Fedorenko has shown that a, a lot, like what we call Broca's area, even within Broca's area, we have two sub areas, right? One that's more language specific and the other ones are more domain general. So the way I think about it is that the basal ganglia play a role, they're like a factory, right? So the, what, are, what you throw at them, wherever the input is coming from and wherever it goes, that's the result you're, you're, you're gonna get. I, the, and, and I think that the basic kind of play a role in multiple aspects. They definitely play a, a role in, in attention and in work in memory, which are important for communication, but they're not, I wouldn't consider them language, specifically language. Um, if I had to guess where, the, where, if I had to guess, I'm gonna say that they, that it's not something specific to language. Um, I think it's specific to cognitive, it's cognitive in general and language is a part of it. I don't know if that answers the question or not, but yeah, I, I, I think, I, I don't think about it as, because if not, we would, we would see that uh, basic ganglia lesions cause aphasia and we don't um, because there are, other, uh, there are other systems that support language specifically, like, I don't know, like a specific language, like, I don't know, uh, but they, they play a role in the kind of process that have to do with language production. Sorry. So I was wondering, uh, you mentioned about looking at each hemisphere, which is a little interesting. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if it's already known or planning to look at, you know, we know that length, hemisphere dominance determines kind of language area yeah. of the brain. So that applies to the cortex. Do you think the more would apply in the, the laterality of the basic area? 
Um, that's a good question. Yeah, so so the, the question was whether if uh, we know that language is uh, as like hemispheric dominance, and the question was whether uh, I think that um, that that same is going to apply to basal ganglia. And the answer, I think, I think it's yes, uh, with the, with the same principle in mind, right? Uh, if if the left side of the brain, or in most in most cases the left, the left side, the left hemisphere has plays a more active role in language processing. That's the basal ganglia are gonna are gonna do that, and actually, and and thinking also that the 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 right hemisphere in general plays a, a high role in, in on inhibition. Um, that also, uh, I think that the the way I my, the hypothesis was that that uh, SDNDBS to the left side is gonna affect language, whether um, uh, to the right side it will not affect language as as much and maybe affect more in, in like non language based inhibitory tasks. So I don't know if that answers the question. Go ahead. So you're, you're planning on worsening language in the By gaining better understanding of that circuit, do you think there's a future path to actually improve language stimulation or maybe change the target language? So the question is like, uh, we know that we there's good evidence that, that, that STN, DB, the STN DBS can worsen um, language fluency, uh, and and if the results of the study can help improve outcomes, and I think it can. Um, I think there's a pathway there. I, I think it's gonna. Have, the, the goal here is to help us first with stimulation. Uh, we talk a little bit about the role of the hyperdirect pathway, which is not so it's not being studied a lot. So if we we see that the the effect is mainly due to inhibition of the uh, hyperdirect pathway, then when people like you are, stimula are stimulating, saying, okay, I have to be careful with the hyperdirect pathway. Um, and there's one study done by the people at Rush where they stimulated the right and then the left, uh, and uh, actually with stimulation of the, of the right uh, STN, that helped, uh, that increased verbal fluency. So there, there might be, what we might be seeing is the net effect uh, of one hemisphere that's affecting language production and the other one may be, I don't know, liberating or uh, help, helping increase it like by decreasing the inhibition. Maybe there's more, there are more errors, but the production itself, the volume of production may be increased. So that's, that's all, that's what I want to know. <laughs> so I have a question. So uh, if I can encapsulate your research, you're going to study folks before and after you, you buzz them, right? So the question is, does recording while people are performing language tasks play a role in what you're studying. And, and by recording, you mean like electrophysiology or yeah, record, record? recording from the stimulator? Um, that's, so <laughs> that's a very good question. Um, initially, I did, uh, th that was not the way the grant was planned, but I do think that it would be ideal in the right setting to do some tasks that you can do in the OR uh, with electro, electrophysiologic recording, like, I mean, something like the way I would envision is like a simple, like three tasks, like um, verbal fluency, because it's what we usually use, something that it was more reading that involves language, but not necessarily so much cognitive, and an, an inhibition task. Um, but yeah, I think that that would be, that's something that I'm going to talk to with people at MUSC to see if we could do it. But yeah, that's, that's a very good thought. All right. Uh... So first of all, thank you so thank you. much for the talk and uh, for the case presentation. And I refer everyone to the paper that's in the chat around today's case presentation. It's really an, an amazing and sad series of, of kids. And uh, everyone else, have a great day and be safe. Well, how do we get rid of this? Oh, yeah, you can't get rid of it. I don't know. <laughs> That's why you and I are watching. I tried to figure out how to get rid of it, and I couldn't. Thank you.